The U.S. elections are over, but the economic problems facing the country are far from over. Not even a day has passed, and already I'm seeing channels with chirons, those are the little bars on the lower thirds, that saying things like countdown to fiscal cliff. Now, this, of course, is the combination of automatic spending cuts and tax cuts set to expire that would take place in January. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan was on TV talking about this this morning, saying he doesn't think think the elections will help avert this cliff. Take a listen. The uh, election per se has really not changed the balance very much of what's going on. And uh, I think it will come down to the very last minute before a particular action is taken. We underestimate the underlying momentum of this deficit and the building up of debt and its consequences. We do not underestimate the momentum of the deficits, the debt, and their consequences, nor the expansionary policies we've seen under an Obama central bank. Is that what's reflected in gold? It's been on a bit of a tear over the last few days, as this chart shows. And not that we prescribe to the notion that one event is responsible for market moves and the animal spirits behind them, but it is interesting that U.S. stock markets we're down today. The S&P saw its biggest decline since June, according to Bloomberg. There was this idea that short-term an Obama win would be better for markets than Romney because it meant more money printing and a more dovish central bank. So what gives? Earlier I asked James Turk, founder of Gold Money and author of the book The Collapse of the Dollar and How to Profit from it, I asked what he thinks is behind the stock market move. Well, you know, the stock market has been going up not because of a good economy, uh, because uh, employment is still relatively low. Uh, the stock market has been going up because of money printing. And what's happened over the past couple of months is that the Fed announced QE3 in September, but they actually haven't been purchasing any government bonds. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve today is the same size as it was two months ago. So the Federal Reserve has to put some juice into the system if it wants to get the stock market rising. That's a really interesting and good point. Now, let's talk about what has returned the most during the last Obama term. There is this great chart. I'm going to put it up for our viewers, and it shows all of these different assets and, and what they've returned. And gold and silver lead the way. Now, we're told by neoclassical economists and policymakers that the Fed needs to print and we need to spend to get on a good growth track and rebuild a healthy economy. But what does it mean that a non dividend yielding asset, two of them actually, have performed the best out of all these financial assets. Yeah, you know, it's not really a return on gold. It's just the appreciation of gold, or to be more precise, the depreciation, depreciation of the purchasing power of the dollar. You know, gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did four years ago. Same thing with silver. What's happened is the dollar purchased a lot less because of all of this money printing. You know, what the Federal Reserve has been trying to do is to jumpstart the economy by printing all of this new money. Quantitative easing is what they call it. Uh, but it really hasn't had any impact. You know, QE1 didn't have much impact. QE2 didn't have much impact. And it's unlikely that QE3 will either. All it will do is continue to depreciate the purchasing power of the dollar. And as a consequence, the price of gold and the price of silver will go up as the dollar loses purchasing power. Yeah, so as you say, you believe QE hasn't had any impact, but what we have seen that has had an impact, arguably, is the government spending that's been going on the last four years, trillion dollar plus budget deficits in the U.S., government debt getting racked up to $16 trillion, no real plan to rein it in, and essentially Americans voted for four more years of that, uh, I would logically argue because they voted for Obama again. Can the U.S. sustain this for four more years without some kind of debt crisis in your view? I don't think so. Um, you know, I've always felt that regardless of who is in the White House, that between 20 and 13 and, uh, 2013 and 2015, uh, everything would come together. Uh, it's simply a mathematical equation of looking at the government's cash flow, in other words, how much revenue it's receiving based on economic activity, and how much money it's spending and likely to spend you know, over this period of time. And I think we're going to hit the crunch still within a 2013 to 2015 time frame.
Okay, wow. So there's a prediction there that you're sticking to. And now, of course, short term, everyone in the U.S. is talking about the fiscal cliff. The elections were yesterday. Today, Alan Greenspan, former Fed chairman on TV, talking about how we need a roadmap to avoid the fiscal cliff. And we can't do this last minute uh, business as they do on Capitol Hill. And he's worried that's going to continue because still we have a Congress and a White House that are divided. My question is with so many people pushing for some kind of a solution to the deficits, to the debt in the United States. And with Washington unable to come to any compromise, isn't the fiscal cliff at least something that achieves some kind of action in terms of helping the deficit situation? And does the fact that people are so freaked out about it and really urging against it show that there's really no tolerance for economic pain at all to deal with the deficit? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I think we can expect over the next couple of months is another uh, downgrade in the U.S. Uh, credit rating, um, simply because of the size of the deficits and the inability or unwillingness uh, of Washington to come to grips with that and to put the country onto a path uh, going back toward in the right direction and in improving the country's solvency. But, you know, the present situation is unsustainable and, um, you know, uh, it, it is going to, um, I think, result in some kind of a, a blow up in the not too distant future. But the important thing, I think, Lauren, is that the, there's a more important concept than the fiscal cliff. It's really a currency cliff. Um, what's going to happen is the dollar is going to continue to lose purchasing power uh, because of inflation and probably also declining against other currencies as well. But at least uh, inflation will be picking up, purchasing power will be declining, and you know the, the dollar is going to go over the cliff. And that's more worrying uh, because once the dollar goes over the cliff, then it's likely that the economy could be irreparably damaged. Oh, wow. And, and the currency cliff is something I want to get to more when we look at what you found in, in your recent paper about gold. But first, before we get into that, kind of to, to get into that nicely, oil today, uh, which is for sure a bellwether of where people think growth is going to be, I, I would guess, because it's a major input. So it fell the most, according to Bloomberg, since November of 2011. Why do you think it's falling? It's the same reason the stock market is falling. You know, the Federal Reserve hasn't been injecting any money into the system. Um, and you know, there was an expression that came out decades ago by a newsletter writer by the name of Richard Russell. He said, inflate or die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's basically the system that, as it exists today. The Federal Reserve has to keep inflating or the system is going to collapse. And because the Federal Reserve hasn't expanded its balance sheet over the, couple, the last couple of months, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about doing it, but the market wants to see some action. And uh, as a consequence, you're seeing a sell-off pretty much across the board in most markets. Really interesting. And, and speaking of central bank inflating when you look at oil prices uh, they look very different depending on which currency you're looking at I want to bring up a chart and this is from uh, gold money this is this is your chart and it shows the uh, crude oil prices from the 70s to June of 2012 in pounds in dollars in euros and gold grams and what's incredible is that the purchasing power of gold uh, in terms of oil it's been able to buy the same amount for decades unlike all of these other other national currencies. Why is that? Um, it's basically because you know gold is money. Um, it's not um, consumed like other assets. It's accumulated, and this above-ground stock of gold grows by approximately the same amount as world population and new wealth creation. So over long periods of time, gold has consistency and purchasing power. Uh, that's why I was saying earlier, it's not that the price of gold is going up. It's that the purchasing power of the dollar is, is going down. You know, an ounce of gold buys the same amount of crude oil it did 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, that shows that it's not a good investment because it hasn't increased your wealth, but it shows that it's very good money because it does one of the important things that money is supposed to do, which is to preserve purchasing power over long periods of time. Right, unlike all of these other national currencies. And when we're talking about the gold stock, you actually found in your research that the stock of gold uh, you found is less than is widely reported. You put it a little over 15,000 tons versus the just more than 171,000 tons that is widely reported. This is a difference of about 16,000 tons or $877 billion in nominal terms. So what is this uh, research based on and, and why does this matter? Well, it, it does matter because, you know, there's a difference between physical gold and paper gold. 
And there's a lot of paper gold out there, uh, but you know, paper gold isn't really gold. It's just exposure to the gold price, and that exposure to the gold price comes with counterparty risk. In other words, it's a financial asset, whereas physical gold is a tangible asset. And as you work through a financial crisis, and you know, we've been in one for a few years, and it's going to continue for a few more years, people ultimately move out of financial assets into tangibles, and the same thing is going to happen in gold. Uh, the fact that there's less physical gold here ultimately means that uh, the panic or the scramble into, out of paper gold and into physical gold is probably going to be even more dramatic than, than people expect, simply because there's a lot less physical gold than people have been led to believe over the past uh, several years. Interesting. What does that mean for the price, do you think? Well, you know, in the longer term, it ultimately means the price is probably going to go even higher than what I've been expecting. Uh, you know, if you have less supply of something than what people think, uh, ultimately it's reflected in the price, and the price is going to go higher. And remind but the us price is going to go higher anyway, Lauren, simply because of the dollar debasement and the other um, factors that are going on um, around the world. And remind us what your projection is of gold, just for anybody that, that can't remember off the top of their head. Well, I've been sticking to this uh, forecast that I made back in 2003 when gold was $350 an ounce. I was saying that between 2013 and 2015, it was going to be $8,000 an ounce and the Dow would be 8000 So you'd have a one-to-one -one relationship between gold and the Dow, just like you did at the end of the last bust, which was 1980, when gold was one-to-one, -one, uh, 800 on gold and 800 on Dow. And just like you did back in the 1930s at the end of that bust, when you had gold at 35 and the Dow at 35. So, you know, this one-to-one -one relationship continues to reappear, and I think that's ultimately where we're headed. But, you know, if the Fed continues on this monetary, uh, monetary uh, quantitative easing path, uh, ultimately, I think the gold price could go much higher. And for reference, because Mr. Turk referred to it, here is a look at the Fed's balance sheet. Since 2007, of course, you can see major increases. However, if you focus in on the last year over there on the far right, you can see it has been relatively flat, which was exactly what he was talking about. Not enough liquidity to feed that drug addiction of the markets. And still ahead. There were more protests in Greece as thousands marched on Parliament while politicians voted on the country's austerity budget. That's right, the Eurozone crisis is still a brewing. We will get James Turk view from the other side of the pond. But first, your closing market numbers. You know how sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know? I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Welcome back from the Eurozone crisis, yeah, it's still going on, to the debate over the Bundesbank's gold reserves. And if they're accounted for truly, I continue talking about it all with James Turk, founder of Gold Money. 
I do want to bring up another one of the charts from your report. It shows the gold stock since 1492 and gold grams per capita. Why is this significant? Is it because this shows a smooth rise versus the more volatile jumps of national currencies or, or, or what? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, Milton Friedman had a number of um, uh, postulates for the monetary uh, theory, uh, the quantity theory of money that, uh, that he developed. And one of those was what was called the K rule, basically that the money supply should increase by a constant amount every year, year in and year out, regardless of economic conditions, because only in that kind of environment would you be able to control inflation. Now, if you look at the dollar supply increases year after year, it's been basically all over the place and at a much higher rate than population growth and new wealth creation, whereas the above ground stock of gold grows by about 1.8 percent per annum consistently year after year. And the reason why this happen is, happens is simply because of the fortuitous way in which gold is dispersed in the Earth's crust. That, uh, you know, as the population gets larger, gold gets harder to find, but the technology makes it possible that we can continue to increase this ever-increasing stock of, of gold by 1.8 percent per annum, which is, fits perfectly Milton Friedman's uh, theories with regard to the quantity of money. Which is so incredible that Mother Nature and just good old supply and demand is much more effective for purchasing power, it would seem, and value than central planners. Imagine that. Is that the big takeaway here? Uh, that's one of the big takeaways. You know, gold's been money for 5,000 years. Um, we've been fooling around with these fiat currencies backed by nothing for only 40 years. We can see all of the problems that we have today uh, with these fiat currencies. And we can see, you know, the purchasing power of gold today has the same purchasing power as it did, you know, 50, 60 years ago when we were talking about crude oil before. Uh, so in my mind, ultimately, uh, we're going to come back to gold. You know, governments will come back quick kicking and screaming back to gold or they're going to do it willingly. Hopefully they'll do it willingly because in that way they can plan for a smooth transition back to a sound solid monetary base rather than continuing to follow this path that they're now doing, which ultimately could lead to, you know, economic problems, severe economic problems as uh, uh, dollars continue to lose purchasing power. Right. Governments typically, uh, at least in my lifetime, don't seem like they ever do it uh, in a planned matter, at least not in the United States. But I'm curious about Germany because there's been some concern about uh, the German central bank's gold holdings. And actually an executive board member of the Bundesbank did recently address these concerns in a speech and said that these are unfounded, irrational fears, that the gold is safe, that the Bundesbank has always had a great relationship with the Federal Reserve. And I'm curious what your thoughts are about this debate on Germany's gold. And I do want to point out that at least this executive committee member did acknowledge the importance of gold. Yeah. The issue is, is where is the Bundesbank's gold? Um, you know, uh, a lot of it had been stored outside of Germany. But you have to look at it from a um, geopolitical point of view. Uh, Owner, uh, ownership of gold is one of the pillars under, underneath the country's sovereignty. Uh, where does the U.S. store its gold? It stores its gold in the United States. Why should Germany s store its gold outside of Germany? It should store it within Germany, in my view. You know, gold is um, dispersed in a variety of different central bank vaults around the world by many countries because of the remnants of the old gold standard, where gold was moved from one part of a, a vault to another part of the vault to settle international transactions. But we stopped that system 40 years ago. You know, gold is now used as a reserve uh, in case you need it for a rainy day or to rebuild the currency. And with all of the problems in Europe today with the euro and the fact that the European Central Bank is not following Bundesbank monetary discipline, I think it would probably make sense for Germany to return its gold you know, and keep it in Frankfurt under the, uh, in the vaults underneath the Bundesbank, just in case. That's very interesting. Is there uh, an accurate or public accounting of gold for central banks? Like the Bundesbank, do we really know if it's all accounted for? No, no, not, not really, because if you look at a central bank's balance sheet, they book a, a one line item. They call it gold and gold receivables. In other words, they're mixing gold in the vault with gold out in loan as the same line item, which doesn't uh, conform with generally accepted accounting principles, but the IMF allows the central banks to do that. In fact, 
Um, if you look at the Bundesbank Act in relation to German, uh, Germany's gold, Section 26 says that they have to prepare their annual accounts according to generally accepted accounting principles, but nevertheless, they book uh, gold and gold receivables as one line item, which doesn't conform with generally accepted accounting principles. And uh, I've underst uh, understood from uh, people who've asked the Bundesbank about this, it's because they, uh, uh, the IMF uh, asks them to report that way rather than uh, conforming with the letter of the law of the Bundesbank Act itself. Oh, and we know how tricky accounting shenanigans can be. Now, I apologize if we get cut off, but I do want to ask your views on Europe currently. Sitting in London, uh, we've been so focused on U.S. elections right now. Uh, it, protests in Greece today. What's your assessment right now in terms of the uh, temperature of the, the, the sickness in Europe right now? Yeah, the situation in Europe continues to deteriorate. Um, the, the economic activity here is, is bad. And uh, it's getting worse simply because there's more government involvement, more government intervention in the free market process. So I think you're going to see more protests, uh, not just in southern Europe, but par other parts of Europe as well, you know, as the economy continues to deteriorate. I don't see any uh, likelihood of a, of a bounce in European economic activity in the foreseeable future. That's pretty ominous. Uh, it is pretty ominous. We're going to have to leave it on that dark thought. But uh, you've brought a lot of light to the discussion today. So thank you so much, James Turk. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Lauren.